green plants get their energy from the sun. Within their cells, light energy is used to synthesize proteins, fats, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates, the molecules of life. This process, photosynthesis, occurs in chloroplasts, the rounded green bodies found in leaf cells. Elodea leaves are made up of just two cell layers, offering an unobstructed view of living chloroplasts. The orientation of the flowing cytoplasm determines the amount of light hitting each chloroplast. When light levels are low, the flow is adjusted so that the chloroplasts get full exposure. Under the more intense light of midday, they circulate around the sides of the cell, reducing exposure to harmful ultraviolet radiation while still receiving plenty of light for photosynthesis. The chloroplast's internal structure was recorded by the first electron microscopes. They revealed that a chloroplast consists of an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and stacks of hollow disks called thylakoids. Lining the thylakoid membrane, a carpet of light-trapping chlorophyll molecules. The soup of enzymes surrounding the thylakoid disks and contained by the inner membrane is called the stroma. This is where the molecules of life are synthesized. Chlorophyll absorbs light energy in the red and blue regions of the spectrum. Green is reflected away, which explains the color of most plants. When a chlorophyll molecule absorbs a photon of light, the photon's energy transfers to an electron. These energized electrons travel to a reaction center chlorophyll, where they transfer to electron transport proteins embedded in the thylakoid membrane, beginning a process that yields high-energy compounds used in photosynthesis. Another reaction occurs on the thylakoid membrane. Water, H2O, is split into hydrogen ions and oxygen. Two oxygen atoms join to form O2 gas, given off as a waste product. The hydrogen ions are pumped into the thylakoid space. An enzyme provides an exit. As the hydrogen ions stream out through ATP synthase, energy from the outflow is used to synthesize ATP from ADP. ATP is life's universal energy carrier, supplying energy to drive biological chemistry in everything from bacteria to mammals. With a further input of energized electrons from another reaction center chlorophyll, NADPH, another powerful energy carrier, is generated. The depleted electrons return to the chlorophyll molecules ready to be excited by another photon of light. The ATP and NADPH generated by these light-dependent reactions provide energy for the light-independent reactions that take place in the stroma using carbon dioxide as raw material. A key product molecule produced in this cycle of reactions is phosphoglyceraldehyde. PGAL for short. The cycle can continue as long as carbon dioxide and the energy carriers made in the light-dependent reactions are present. The output is a steady stream of PGALs. An enzyme converts two molecules of PGAL into a molecule of glucose sugar, a basic cell fuel. For long-term storage, plants convert glucose into starch a storage product that is taken advantage of by animals of many kinds. Green leaves are not the only place to find chloroplasts. Many kinds of single-cell protists contain them. Hundreds in Euglena spirogyra, one in Chlamydomonas. Multi-cell photosynthetic organisms probably evolved from single cells like these by way of colonial forms like these. The largest colonies contain thousands of cells, some specialized for locomotion and others for asexual and sexual reproduction. Such complex colonies were an evolutionary stepping stone to simple multicellular plants. The simplest living plants are liverworts. Their flattened bodies have no vessels, so liverworts rely on diffusion to transport materials from cell to cell. Liverworts reproduce both sexually, these little umbrellas contain the gametes, 
and asexually by fragmenting, or in this one, by cups containing packets of germinal cells dispersed when a raindrop hits the cup. Mosses have structures that resemble the leaf, stem, and root systems of higher plants. However, they lack an effective transport system, which explains their small size. During dry conditions, mosses shrink to gray fragments of parchment-like tissue. Then, with the first drop of rain, the moss plant comes to life, soaking up many times its weight in water. In this moss, sperm are produced in a splash cup. Sperm carried in splash drops fertilize eggs developing in female plants. In mosses, the fertilized eggs grow into fruiting bodies filled with spores. Dispersed by wind, spores grow into new moss plants. By 400 million years ago, plants with vessels for transporting nutrients and water around the plant body appeared, plants such as horsetails and ferns. A section cut from the shaft of a fern frond and magnified 40 times shows the tubes that transport materials around the plant. Microplumbing allows some ferns to grow into relatively tall trees. Below ground, a fern develops a massive rhizome from which new fronds emerge as fiddleheads. In most ferns, spores are produced in sporangia located on the underside of the frond. In this one, clusters of sporangia are protected by a covering that slowly opens under drying conditions. Each sporangium is equipped with a mechanism for dispersing the spores, a spring-like annulus. Under tension produced by the annulus, the sporangium splits open, the annulus slowly flexes, and snaps away the spores. Sometimes the entire sporangium goes flying off. If spores land on moist soil, or a film of auger in a culture dish, they germinate, producing tiny gametophyte plants, the sexual stage in the fern life cycle. The gametophyte develops both male and female sex organs. Fertilization usually takes place in a film of rainwater. Each fertilized egg can grow into a new sporophyte plant. Ferns and their relatives dominated the land beginning around 400 million years back, but by 200 million years ago, larger plants were taking over, 